All right, thank you. Um, so as was just stated, I have this awesome job where I get to develop and shape the next generation of mechanical engineers. Um, today I'm going to be talking about engineering education, but I think a lot of, specifically about engineering education, but a lot of what I say I think can be extended to uh, STEM education and education much more broadly. Um, whenever I give a talk in front of uh, a general audience, I like to ask this question first because in my experience, many people don't know what a mechanical engineer does. Um, and I like to dispel a few mis misunderstandings. First of all, we are not the people who drive trains. <laughs> and we are not the people who fix your car. So, but, but we are the people. We mechanical engineers are the one who, ones who create the car. And when I say create the car, what I mean is we are the ones who make it work. We scrutinize every nut and bolt that goes into the machine. We make it, make it run efficiently, run safely, run, uh, meet performance characteristics that, that need to be, de need to be uh, achieved, and so forth. So we're, we're the ones that make it work. Uh, in addition to cars, we make other everyday items you see, like vacuum cleaners. We make things that are literally out of this world. We make things that are huge. We make things, we create things that are small, really small. We create things that go fast, things that, that search the skies, things that, that, machines that walk, machines that hoist and float and fly. We do incredible things. It's an incredible uh, uh, field to be in. Um, you might ask what distinguishes a man, an engineer from, say, your Uncle Ernie and the, and the, and the wonderful masterpieces that he creates. And, and the answer to that, if I could, if I could summarize it in, in just one slide, is this stuff. This is the stuff that makes it work. Um, in particular, this is the stuff that, that most interests me. This is control theory. But, but in general, we, we engineers have some, some, some representation like that. We use it to, and it's absolutely necessary in what we do. If you want to design a modern bridge that won't collapse under its own weight, it's the analysis that needs to happen. It's because our, our, our designs have to abide by the, the, the laws of uh, physics, the laws of nature. And those laws can be represented mathematically. And if we can construct construct mathematical models of these things, then we're able to analyze them, we're able to predict their behavior, we're able to optimize, we can do incredible stuff. We can make, uh, we can build cars that, that, that are light enough and efficient enough to get 58 miles per gallon, but strong enough to take a hit, right? It's this analysis, though, which makes learning engineering incredibly difficult because students come to us interested in this stuff, but there's this disconnect because we give them this stuff instead, right? <laughs> and, and this makes it an incredible challenge for them. It's also an incredible challenge for us trying to teach because we, we, you know, us, uh, we professors spend several years getting a PhD, learning this stuff. We, we, we understand it. It has meaning to us. We, we see the connections. We see the symmetries. It's a thing of beauty to us. And we often forget that to our students it looks more like this. <laughs> So, so there are these, there's these challenges here. It's incredible amount of, of maturity that we have to develop in our students, uh, uh, learning that has to take place. But, but learning this stuff is like learning anything hard and worthwhile. It takes a few things. It takes a lot of practice, hours and hours of practice, and it takes a lot of motivation because somewhere along the line you're going to get frustrated, you're going to crash and burn, but you have to have some sort of motivation to keep you going through. Um, fortunately, our textbooks provide us a lot of that first stuff, a lot of things to practice, uh, problems, dozens of problems throughout the book, problems like these. And the unfortunate part, we also have problems like these. And, and the bad part is that, that a lot of these problems you'll find in the textbooks are very, very narrowly defined. They're looking for just one right answer. And that's really not what engineering is. Um, these skills are absolutely necessary to develop, but, but it really doesn't instill what it's all about. Um, so we, we supplement our, our, our work, our, our assignments with things like this, things that are a little more open-ended, let, let students explore more, and that definitely helps. But it's still, a lot of these textbook problems, a lot of these sort of cooked up problems here, uh, don't really inspire much. They do, do not do a whole lot to do that second piece, the motivating students to, to trudge through this and to, to try to make sense of it and to, and to really uh, try to learn. 
Um, so I've been thinking for many years about how one can possibly spice this up, how one can possibly sort of make this more meaningful and, and engaging. So take this uh, projectile problem. You gotta, you gotta, I don't know what we need to do. Somehow we need to study the flight of some projectile along some uneven surface. What if we, for example, turned it into a problem more like this, where we have a giant slip and slide. And this, is, this was a viral, viral video several years ago. And he's gonna slide down and zoom into the air, just like in that problem I just sh showed, and poof. <laughs> so, so what if we had that problem instead? So you're turning this, this, this problem into s where you're just getting some right answer into something that where your answer, <laughs> where your answer had consequences. By the way, this was a big hoax, by the way, but, but it's still really cool to look at. <laughs> and you can imagine just how can you formulate your, your engineering problems more like this, something that can capture the imagination, capture, capture the desires of the student to want to find some answers so this guy lives through this thing. Um, and of course, w when you're learning things, there's always this little safety net. You learn in, with the foam pit. You try to learn in ways where you can make mistakes and, and, and go on and, and learn from those mistakes. So for the past several years, I've been, the way I've been approaching it is to develop video games. And this is one game I developed, actually sort of developed. I took a, 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 an existing video game that was out there called Torx, and I modified it so it was a video game where you have a, a steering wheel or a joystick or something, you drive cars around and you race and stuff, stuff like that. But it was an open source game, so I threw away that part where, where the, it had the common interface and made it so you can only drive these cars if you had programmed instructions for the cars to drive themselves. Think of the Google car. You're, you're familiar with that self-driving car. It's the exact same concept where you, the students, in this case, the students have to uh, develop algorithms for the car to drive itself through this world. It has to sense its surroundings, turn at the right time. Sometimes it doesn't work quite well, but it ha these algorithms have to get the car to somehow get itself back on track so continue racing. And by the way, this was in 2005 before there was a Google car. So we're kind of at the cutting edge here. So, we're, so students, instead of doing this textbook problems, they were doing problems where, where, where their calculations, and their computations, they can see the consequences of them. They can see whether things work or not. And they can be engaged in things. And they can, there's many different routes to, to possible solutions. And they can even be creative and paint their own cars here and do interesting things. So it was a, it was a really interesting experience. And also students would, would, for final projects, would maybe drive their car 75 miles per hour backwards and you push a button and it does one of these flips. And you know, they got really creative and they're doing really interesting things with these things. In fact, we, we did things where you have motorcycles in the game and you, how do you program this thing to stabilize a wheelie? So, so we had a lot of fun with that. But there's limitations in what you can do with cars and motorcycles. So actually, uh, back in 2010, I started developing another game I call Spumoni. And in Spumoni, you're, you, you pilot this little vehicle here I call a Spookcraft. And in different challenges, the Spookcraft takes different forms. Sometimes it's like this one. Sometimes it's another one where it just swings around. And you're trying to get from one point in this world to another point in this world. Uh, employ, empl uh, using your mathematical skills and physical skills, f physical reasoning skills, try to understand what's going on. This particular game was developed for my, my sophomore level class, Dynamics. I love Dynamics. But it's the class that where, where students really prove whether they can make it or not in engineering. This is one of these crazy classes where, where it's, it's really to test whether you can survive. So I wanted to create something for that class in particular. And in a moment, we'll go through a particular example, but, but you can see more or less what it looks like. But, but we have these physical systems here that, that students have to navigate through and, and, and work with. So what I'd, and oh, uh, by the way, in my courses, I typically make the textbook optional, but everyone has to have a game pad because we're going to, we're going to be playing some games. Um, so let me go through a specific exercise that I have students do near the beginning of the semester. And this one, they're, they're piloting this craft. I'll show this a couple of times. Um, and the goal is to land on this little landing pad you see at the bottom, and it'll cycle through again. Maybe, maybe not. 
I thought it would. But you saw that gate come across, right? That, and, it clipped the, and it clipped the little uh, vehicle. That was because the vehicle was coming down too slowly. It needed to get past that gate quick, more quickly. If, it get, if, it, you, if you descend faster, it'll get past the gate, but this time you're going too fast and you crash in the bottom. There's some sort of middle ground, some place where you can get go fast enough and get by the gate, but not go too fast where you crash into the ground. And students will play this for hours trying to find that exact right thing. And I rigged this system against them. I changed the mass of the Spoocraft every single time. So there's, you can play probably a thousand times and maybe get it once and it won't, it, it won't work. I've rigged it so they have to do some sort of analysis to actually get through this thing. So they do their analysis, they draw their diagrams, they set up the equations in motion, integrate their equations. What they have to do is find a mathematical rule that tells you, tells the, the game exactly how much thrust to apply and when to apply it. So you get exactly through this thing. And when it works, oh, and then you have to describe your, your, your strategy mathematically and program it in. And when it works, it looks like this. You turn on your thruster at just the right time. You make it barely past that gate and you don't crash. Let me just show you that again really quickly. I'll stop it right here. That's how much error you, margin of error you had in missing that gate. And then it's falling down and it's not even, it's still going down. Ooh, it just turned around right there. So the ra it's a razor thin margin of error. So they have to get this thing exactly right to make it work. But when it works, it's wonderful. Actually, they never get it the first time. It takes several times. And it's a different type of problem than those textbook problems. What they're doing is they're, they're judging from the, just what they see on the screen what the problem is. There's nothing telling them that, that here's what you have and here's what you have to calculate. They, they look at the problem. They realize that I'm not giving them any information about that gate closing. So why? They, they're, they're, confused, and they realize eventually that, ah, if I get the thing down in the minimum of that amount of time, I don't have to worry about that gate. So I, they have to sort of formulate what the problem is themselves and make sense of it themselves. And it's hard. It's much harder than those other, other uh, questions that, that I showed you. And when you get it, they feel elated. It's really a sense of accomplishments. When they, when they get it, they have to send me a passcode. It's an encrypted file that, that proves that they actually solved it. And, and when I get the, uh, the emails, you can see it like this. It says, I beat it, and I get the, uh, the several exclamation points. It says, got it. I get emails that say, and you get another challenge. I get some trash talk in here, <laughs> right? And this is wonderful. In my 15 more, 20 years of, of teaching, I've never had a student turn in a regular assignment and just slap it down and say, I got it, caller. Uh, bring it on. In your face. Right? This, this, but but in the, with these games, they feel such pride in it, at least electronically. They, they're, 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 they're pumping their fists. And they're, they're, having, they're showing me their, their pride in this. Um, I... I Work with uh, my classes. I work with uh, an online forum called uh, Piazza, where students post their questions, and they can answer. Other students or I can answer the questions. And for a typical homework assignment, you will find that that maybe we'll get a couple questions, two or three, whatever. But when we have Spumoni assignment, the whole thing is filled up with these these questions about the game. They're all getting involved. They're all helping each other out. There's this wonderful community where they're helping each other out. They're not giving each other the answers, but they're trying to give each other clues on how to get through. And it's awesome. It's wonderful. And then when Halloween comes around, it's crazy. They start <laughs> dressing up as characters in the game. And it's, it's weird, but I love it. Um, <laughs> when I saw Kyle do this, I almost cried. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so they're really getting into this. They're, they're, they're living it. And another question might be, well, are the students learning? Um, we started measuring this in many different ways. Uh, experts organize their knowledge in very different ways than novices do. Experts have these ways of structuring deep concepts and linking them together and linking some types of concepts to other types of concepts um, in, in particular ways. And we have students draw concept maps. That is how they understand a certain subject and draw lines that, that connect certain subjects to each other that are related to each other. And we found that students who learned with the game have concept maps that look much more like 
those of experts than the students who learn without, without the game. Uh, we have sort of traditional concept tests, standardized tests that test dynamics knowledge, and we find that students who learn with the game store about, score about eight-tenths of a standard deviation better than those who learn without the game. We find that students who take the game-based course go on to take similar courses in the same domain at a much greater level for their technical electives than students who don't take uh, the game-based course. So, so it's changing their behavior, it's changing their performance rather dramatically. The next question, why does it work? Well, I don't know for sure, but I have a few guesses. One is uh, the type of problems we get them. So I'll ask you, which of the, these two things is the more authentic engineering problem? And if you look at it from a surface level, you, you might say, well, this one on the right, it looks like a cartoon, and the one on the left looks, looks like something that might be on my garage or something, right? So you might say, hey, this one on the left is, is the more authentic one. But if you look at what, what is asked of the students, the one on the left, you're just calculating some answer that has no meaning to you. It might give you a good grade, but other than that, there's nothing else. The one on the right, when you work through the problem there, you're actually getting a solution. You're getting an answer that has a purpose. And the purpose is to make things work. And that's what engineers do. So I claim the one on the right is the more authentic problem. Let me show you this video again. I showed it to you before, right? This is where a student was trying to develop a controller that would stabilize his wheelie motion. And he's getting actually pretty cocky right here. He's getting the... the <laughs> The writer to do this, but <laughs> what did you just observe? A lot of the room just started laughing, right? It happens every time. Every time I show this at the end, people start laughing. And why? Because it's funny, right? It's funny. I don't know why it's funny, but it's funny. And when you crash and burn like that, it's funny. And what you do in video games is when you crash, you, you're, you expect to crash. You expect to not do well. But when you crash, you just get up, you, you just hit the reset button, and you go again, right? Failing in this context is so much easier. There's no consequences. You just, uh, you just pick yourself up and you go again. Whereas failing on, on the other homework exercise, there's, there's some bad emotions associated with that. Failing is a very important part of learning. And when you're learning in this framework, you just get up, you go ahead, and you, you try it again, and I'll actually switch ahead. And the game has built into it a ways for you to see what's actually happening in the game. So you can compare these, these data that are being produced with what you expect. So students can be hypothesizing, they can be probing what went wrong with their, with their solution, and then they can uh, propose new solutions, and they can try it again. And if it doesn't work, they get immediate feedback that it doesn't work, and then they can try again. And guess what? They're behaving like engineers do. Right? Not like students who are just trying to get the right answer in those other exercises, but, but behaving like engineers do. Trying to troubleshoot like engineers do. And my, my hypothesis is that students are doing much significantly better in this, in this type of envi learning environment because they're behaving in the way that they, they say, I want to become an engineer. That's why I'm here. I want to do engineering work, and finally, they're doing it. So that's all I have for today.